but without much further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Greg. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Who's for a shoot? Who's for a shoot? <laughs> Never mad loud. Uh, welcome everybody. Just to, uh, just to make sure if you haven't seen it on uh, the screen already, make sure you're in the right place. Uh, this is this workshop is Asian American leadership in a white American world. Effective leadership without abandoning who you are. Um, as Lam said, my name is Greg Shu, and I'm a campus minister, campus pastor at the University of Virginia, uh, specifically with Asian University Christian Fellowship. Um, I work specifically with Asian and Asian American students to navigate life and see how faith and spirituality intersect. Uh, our community is one that's extremely diverse from all different ethnic and religious backgrounds. Just helping people kind of figure out who they're supposed to become, uh, what their culture has to do with it, and uh, how does God and faith in Jesus play into that. So uh, that's kind of my background there. Just briefly about me, uh, I am a Chinese American, uh, born in the States, uh, originally from Pittsburgh, but I call Boston home. Uh, I graduated from Duke in 2010, focusing, uh, majoring in political science uh, with a focus on international relations, and then I minored in English and religion. Uh, so I'm super excited to be here because I love VSA. Uh, without VSA, I would never really know how good real pho is. And, uh, it's kind of a problem now because like, whenever I go home, like I always want to have it, but I'm not Vietnamese. So like I go out like four times over break, mom's like, you're going crazy. And I actually like pho better than a lot of the Chinese noodles that I grew up with. So again, sort of a problem. I have my own ethnic identity down. issues, Thanks. obviously. Um, but so before we get going, I actually want to give you a chance to introduce yourselves to each other. I want you to pair up with somebody. And uh, just briefly, yes, that's right, okay? Uh, I want you to go through your name, your year, your school, and an AIM screen name, or more than one if you had more than one like me, I had no. So how many of you had like an Asian or Asian something in your screen name when you were younger? Really? Okay. Come on, you can, it's okay, you can raise your hands, you can be embarrassed about it. So uh, for me, my, uh, my screen name when I was in middle school and then onward was AZN History Maker, because there, there was like a song, and I had a big ego, right? So uh, I kind of went with that, and then I, actually, I actually changed it in high school in part because I, I actually stopped kind of uh, participating in Asian cultural stuff when I was in high school, and actually even less so when I was in college, which is something I actually uh, regret in a lot of ways. Um, but it's actually only since coming back into doing, being a campus minister, actually dig, digging into my faith and seeing how actually God cares about culture that I've kind of reconnected with uh, the Asian community in a broader sense and the Asian movement and activism. So uh, all to say, I, I am excited to be here, but also I share that to say that you all come from different Asian American experiences. Um, some of you may be adopted and both your parents are non-Asian. Uh, you may be mixed ethnically. Uh, you may have thought from a, you know, in the middle of high school, you knew you were going to be part of VSA or something. And some of you were like, heck no, I'm not going to be part of VSA, and now you're here, right? Yep. Uh, so all I have to say, you know, you come from different backgrounds, and somehow uh, you're here in this room at this conference with Mavsa, involved with your respective VSAs at your schools. And so I know that we come from different places, and I'm excited for you to be here. I'm excited, and I hope that as you move forward today, no matter what kind of background you're coming from, something will be helpful as you look at sort of the issue of culture and leadership and what to do with that. So, okay, let's kind of move on with that then. Uh, so you might be wondering, why is a Chinese-American campus pastor at uh, Mobsen? Well, uh, one of the things that I, I wear many hats in my job, I do a lot of things. I am sort of a professional Christian friend. I am a counselor. I give a lot of advice. Uh, oftentimes relationship advice seems to be what people ask me about most of the time. But one of the things I do a lot of is also leadership development. Uh, I'm really invested in helping students develop into leaders. Uh, and particularly, as I mentioned kind of before, I care a lot about the intersection of faith and spirituality, but also, uh, uh, sorry, culture and spirituality, but also culture in the midst of other cultures. Uh, a sense of ethnic identity matters a lot to me. And so I've been doing that for the last several years. I love helping students kind of approach leadership and leadership development, particularly with an understanding of culture. So that's why I'm doing this seminar. Um, I'm doing this seminar because I believe that uh, the cultural and ethnic framework is crucial for Asian Americans if we are going to succeed uh, and achieve the goals or sort of career aspirations that you might have kind of moving forward. Um, and, and kind of specifically, it's because the current narrative in the United States as far as being an Asian American and succeeding is a little bit confusing. By some accounts, uh, we are doing fantastically well. If you look at the census data or the economic data, Asian Americans are the best educated and uh, most well off financially of any ethnic subgroup. 49% of Asian Americans have a bachelor's degree. Uh, only 27% of whites have a bachelor's degree. If you look at the income, uh, both individual and household. So we not only go to good schools and get good educations, we leave and we get good jobs and make a lot of money. That's doing pretty good. Uh, and actually, I'm sure you see this at your universities, wherever you're from. 
Um, we're well represented, some would say overrepresented, but in my opinion, you know, if you're good enough to get in, you should get in. So if you look at UVA, for instance, there's 14% of the university is Asian and Asian American, 14%. The state of Virginia is actually only 5.5%, you know, so we're kind of overshooting the proportionality in markets of education. That's a good thing. We're doing well. Our ethnic subgroup is doing well as a whole. But then there's also this other side that is a little, that doesn't really agree with the first part. Um, we're underrepresented in organizational and corporate leadership. If you go look at most corporations, most organizations, uh, law firm, anything like that, if you kind of clump the ladder higher and higher and higher, the percentage of Asians that are in these high-level positions is proportionally less and less, fewer and fewer. So somehow, we're at the top of the educational and income ladders, but we're not proportionally at the top of the leadership or organizational leadership ladder. Um, there's an effect that sort of uh, one author named Jane Hyun, she's a leadership specialist, talks about what's called the bamboo ceiling. Uh, I think this is a true thing. You may disagree. I think maybe if you go into the real life uh, circumstances, and you just are trying to get jobs, like you may encounter that at some point. But I think the bamboo ceiling is a real thing. And while I can't spend today kind of going after all of the cultural and racialized underpinnings of this sociologically, my goal is to kind of try and help equip you as students think about the practical things you do have control over, right? You may, you may not be able to control sort of our perceptions in the media or just the bigger cultural experience that we have, but you can control some of your own choices and how you see yourself and how you make your choice when it comes to leadership. So that's sort of what I'm doing today. There's a practical application to kind of address this racialized gap. That's what I'm hoping we're going to do today. You know, so um, as you move forward, wherever you are in college and, and beyond college, uh, you have goals and aspirations for leadership and success in careers. Um, and I'm going to assert that you need to, for your own sake, let alone the sake of those who will come after you, you need to have a culturally astute, a culturally aware, and ethnic identity lens through which to view your choices in your leadership context. So um, simply, I'm not gonna, it's not very complicated today. What we're going to do is we're going to assess our cultural experience. Then we're going to sort of reinterpret our cultural experience in a way that's more empowering instead of assimilative. I'll get to that. That'll make more sense when I kind of get there. Because what I really want for you is to be able to succeed and achieve the things you feel called to achieve, but yes, they'll be authentic and who you're really supposed to be at the end of the day. Um, and ultimately, at the end, there'll be time for question and answer. Uh, you can do that at the end as well. Okay, so assessing our cultural experience. You're going to go back into your pairs. Uh, don't move around. Just pick someone next to you. And go through these three questions to kind of just get our brains thinking along this. Uh, think of specific leaders you admire. What characteristics do you share? Uh, what do you admire about them? What do you lack? What things were hard to explain to friends of a different ethnic background? That's question two. And three, are there characteristics of your Asian experience that you think might be a liability when it comes to moving forward in your career or your future or leadership? Okay? So uh, I'm curious. I want to hear a little bit, just a couple for kind of each question from the crowd. You know, so who would like to answer or share about the first question? Anybody? I'd love to hear your experiences. Be brave. We're all nice here. No one's going to bite. <laughs> uh, name and school, and then go ahead. Michael, I'm a sophomore at Georgetown. Um, in high school, I had the chance to meet Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. And it was just really cool to interact with someone who had to grow up in an environment in which she didn't find leaders who were like her. She couldn't identify with anyone. Mm. And you would think either she'd be arrogant because she's someone who could achieve it, and most people who were like her couldn't. Or she's just underconfident because she can't identify with many other leaders. Sure. But in fact, she was very down to earth, very humble, very confident, and I'm sure of herself. <coughs> okay, that's cool. That's the kind of leader I kind of want to be, so that's awesome. Thanks. Anyone else for the first question? Name, school. Oh, um, uh, my name is Zoe, or Lorenzo. I'm a fourth year graduating May from UVA. So I admire um, Ivo Ray, um, especially because he's um, a di considered a dissident in China, but I really appreciate how, even though he might not be Asian American, but he's Asian and he really just speaks and develops his ideas and articulates his forms of protest mm -hmm. through online media and artworks, and people can actually see that all over the world. But I do I like how he like stands up against such a huge government, especially the Chinese government. For me, it's really um, unfathomable for me doing that. But I like how he risks his life every day. He has a family, and for me, he stands out by not only being a little bit different with his art, but in addition to that, being still outspoken and risking his life. And I wish I could be more like that. Every day. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. For me, you know, so I grew up in a church context, right? So the uh, I go to church every Sunday. 
And uh, the pastor is Chinese, and if you know anything about Chinese pastors, they're notoriously bad at preaching. They ramble, they're confused, they get, they confuse themselves, they don't know where they are, and I'm like sitting in there, I'm like, I don't even speak Tonghua that well, I don't even speak that well, I was like, where am I going to go, I'm, I'm in trouble. So I, when I was getting older, like, I would still be in church, and I'd be like, you know, I listened to other pastors, and I sort of liked the way that they preached instead. So there were certain white pastors that I, I took a liking to, they're a little more reasoned, they seemed a little more logical in their flow. But I really was fond of black pastors, I really like uh, MLK, and because uh, like, you know, you know, that's right, there's, uh, there's, cause there's just some fire and some ferocity, and there's, there's fearlessness in the way that they preach, and I'm actually told that when I get really riled up and I start preaching, uh, I had this one black coworker. He was like, "I didn't know you were black," and I was like, "Okay, I don't know. I mean, maybe this is, I just soaked that up because I, I listen to listen to different things and I've been shaping my cultural experience." But yeah, okay. So how about the second question? Um, what things were hard to explain to friends that were not of your same ethnic or cultural background? There should be no shortage of these. Uh, back there first. Name, school. Uh, I'm Vinny from the Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay no, no. So, so what was it like? Well, how did you try to explain it to them then? <laughs> yes. That's right. That's right. Good. I like that. That's good. That's not silly. That's that's serious. Your mom thinks it's serious, so it's serious, right? All right. Who else? For number two. Anyone else? There's a bunch of hands. Viet, go ahead. Name school. Viet, from Viet. One thing that was really difficult to explain to my friends was. Uh, family values, how um, sometimes my friends would want to go hang out or something, I'd say that uh, I'm hanging out with my family, or uh, my family's going out to dinner tonight, I have something to do with my family, and then mm -hmm. they're like, okay, well, I, like, sometimes they wish they had that too, but you know, it's like different for sure. family to go do whatever they want. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty similar to mine. You know, so even though like I'm a grown man now, like during, I'm on like the semester schedule like you guys, right? So uh, winter break I have time, and summer break I still have time too. I do other things. I'm, you know, I'm traveling a lot, but I have a significant amount of open time. And so you know, a lot of my my peers or coworkers like they'll hear me say like, oh yeah, like you know, I'm going to be home for a little while, and they're like, what's like a little while? And I'm like, oh, you know, three weeks. I don't know. Just like I'm I'm used to. I'm there's a bit of a default mode that I'm going to spend time at home at some point. It's probably going to be you know just a bunch of, a bunch of weeks in a row. And they're like, so like, what's the occasion? And I'm like, uh, what? Like there there is no occasion. Like going home is the occasion. Like you, that's what you do. Like it's break time. Like you have a family. Like. They still alive, right? I, I can get on a plane. So like, you know, like, why, why would I not? But like, we clearly have a different set of priorities when it comes to how we view and value our time there. And for me, it's almost like a, it's like a law, not in a bad way, I just, I assume it. I assume that I'm gonna be spending time at home at some point and like, that's generally something, you know, they're like, is it, is it fun? I hope you have fun. I'm like, well, it's fun, but like, that's like not why I'm there. Like, that's not why you go home. Like, you go home just to be home, you know? So I think I feel you on that one. Yeah. One more, go ahead. Uh, Adante Philip Smith from UVA. Okay. Um, okay. I went to high school in St. Louis County, Missouri, um, in like a 99% white community, and the culture there was pretty much everyone believed you had to act towards your color. Like, whatever your color is dictates how you're supposed to act. And my friend group was mostly, you could say I had the Asian experience, because most of my friends were from the like, Asian continent. So, no one. <laughs> So no one, them, white people, black people, really no one understood like why you don't act the way your color is supposed to act. And I, I being from New York, I didn't even understand like why they think like that. So I don't know. Sure. sure. That was always hard. It was hard for me to even answer that question. Yeah, you, you even it may not even be language for that. You know. So yeah, yeah I understand. Well, let's go to the let's go to the third one. This one I think is a little more challenging, but anybody would like to share about. Characteristics of your Asian experience you think could be a liability. Good name in your or name uh, school. Tuan from UVA. Well, I think one I guess like really big liability that uh, Asians face is that we're sort of just like people view us as like the workhorse. Like if there's something that needed to be done, we'll get it done, and everyone would just like dump the work to us. But like that's pretty much in their eyes. I feel like that's all we're good for is just like getting the work done there. So it's sort of like hinder us from like advancing to like leadership position just because we're so used to just receiving the work in order for people and finishing that. So. Sure, I can see that definitely. You kind of get connoted as the workhorse or really to be more honest, the mule. You carry things for people, right? That's sometimes how it feels, sure. Anyone else? One more maybe? Right there in the middle of the glasses. What's your name and school? 
Okay. And I think uh, we tend to be a lot more respectful towards others than our maybe other American counterparts because we like to listen to what others like to say before we tell them like our opinion and kind of instead of like being outspoken and just jumping in and like being like rash. Sure. Yeah, that's similar to mine. I was gonna say, you know, especially when I was younger, more so. But like, when you grow up with a, when you go out with like, a group of friends to go like eat somewhere, it takes a long time to figure out what you want to eat because like, you've got to ask everybody like ten times to figure out what they really want, right? And uh, if I were with other people, kind of like they would, they were to see that, you know, they were to see me kind of like in this decision making process, taking a long time to figure out what we're gonna go eat, as if I don't have an opinion, right? Uh, you know, people sort of perceive that as like, oh, like he doesn't have an opinion, he doesn't think for himself, he doesn't really care. He doesn't have interests or passions, you know, so like why would you want him to lead? And like you know how this kind of thing is, like people reference like the randomest crap when they're you know sort of forming opinions about you, right? And like if they were if you were being passed in front of a review board, right, for like an application for something, you could imagine somebody saying something like, Oh, like, you know, I don't really think this guy's leadership quality. I mean, like he can't even figure out where he wants to go to dinner. That's the kind of thing that we hear sometimes. Microaggressions come out like that. I mean, that's how opinions are formulated sometimes, you know. So I think that there are ways in which a lot of our traits can be interpreted, or as we might say, misinterpreted uh, negatively as a liability. And I just want to go over a couple, I realize these are generalizations, um, uh, and they may not kind of all apply to you in all of your context, but I think uh, just try and glean the principle that as we kind of look forward here that you know maybe something will kind of make sense for your specific experience or context. So we're going to look at just four common traits of you know sort of Asian American cultures uh, and just kind of see how this plays out in the workplace or, or leadership sometimes. Uh, as was mentioned before, we have a good, a lot of respect for authority and seniority, and uh, we learn that at home because, like, there are certain things you don't say to your parents. You don't necessarily know why you just don't, right? You don't ask certain things. It's just the way that we we're taught to grow up. But uh, in in mainstream or predominantly white leadership or organizational settings, this kind of deference can be perceived negatively. Um, this can be, you know, American culture is fairly individualistic, and so the thought process is sort of like, oh, like might makes right. So the louder you are, the stronger you are, the better you are. And so if you defer to people who are older than you, then you really don't have an opinion. You must not be very good for anything. Um, it's it's possible that you'll be assumed to be cooperative. They, if you're ever in like a voting context, they might not. People who are of different ethnic backgrounds, particularly white folks, may not come around and kind of seek your votes or seek your opinion because they're like, oh, you know. He just defers to whatever's above, like, I don't really need this person's opinion. I don't need this person. Um, and, you know, you could be seen as a yes man, because uh, you're not a leader, you're just a drone. That's just one of the ways in which, some of the ways in which respect for authority could be perceived negatively in a mainstream or majority context. Uh, also, Asians and Asian Americans, we tend to be collectivist, community oriented. Uh, we are consensus builders when it comes to decisions or choices. Um, and so again, even like the idea of like, where, what restaurant are we going to go out to eat tonight? You know, the kind of way that the time that takes to kind of process that. Um, oftentimes in white corporate settings, the way that a decision is arrived at is through competition and argument, right? So the whole idea of sort of like a pitch, right? The sales pitch. Only white people do that. Asians do not do sales pitches to each other and their families. That's not how we do this thing. That's not how we have our relationships, right? So you may go in front of a series of board directors or sort of who is ever in charge of your company, and six of you will give a pitch, right? To try and argue that my idea is the best. Now, that's one way to make decisions, for sure, right? But if you're consensus oriented, the thing is, if you're not the one in charge and you spend a lot of time asking people others, other people's opinions, if you're not the one in charge, it makes it sometimes seem like you don't have an opinion. You don't think. All you want to do is ask other people what they think. Do you think anything at all? And so you can get passed over. Uh, you can be sort of not included. And you know, ironically, even though you ask everyone else what they think, they may not ask you what you think. Because they don't think that it's like, well, I have my opinion already. Why do you need, you know, I don't want to give you more. Like, you, you just figure your own thing out. I figured it out already. That's just another one of those. Uh, moving on. Um, control or emotionally restrained. Um, in your, in like a VSA context or like a largely predominant, like if you're in a same ethnicity context, you probably will not do this, but maybe it's worth noting that how, how do you interact or react in a mostly white context? Are you different? Do you speak less often? Do you speak less loudly? How do you interact with people of different cultures, especially white majority cultures? Uh, I think oftentimes compared to uh, our white counterparts, uh, the white students or white leaders, we are less emotionally expressive. Uh, maybe we learned that from our parents because like, you know, uh, Asian dad, right? So, I mean, that's, it's, there's a lot of reasons where that could come from, but we tend to be less expressive, right? But the thing is, if, if you're used to sort of, if they're used to sort of this like Western baseline for sort of like feelings everywhere all the time, then you could be perceived as lacking passion or lacking interest in your organization or your mission, right? You know, like sometimes like we get a lot of homework, you just go do it, 
right? And then they might say, oh, like, are you above the work you're doing because you don't show an opinion about it? You're just kind of like doing it, right? You don't, you try to, it's not worth the feeling. Like it's not worth sort of exerting an emotion, right? We don't think that way. But it can be perce perceived as, oh, this person really doesn't have their heart in it. They're not someone that I want to consult. They're arrogant, you know, or they're disinterested. That's not somebody I want to advance in a corporation or an organization. Um, and sort of just the fourth one, uh, we tend to be more modest when it comes to our accomplishments. I think in terms of being Asian, like we are, most of us find it fairly dis distasteful to constantly trumpet how many things you have done. Uh, partly because our parents do that already, and then like it gets really awkward with your cousins when like, oh, he's making so much money, you're like, oh gosh, I want to hear that again, right? So like we don't want to, we care about our relationships, like we don't want to like create conflict because that corners somebody into responding with their own accomplishment or achievement. And like most of us, we're, we're more peace oriented than that. We don't want to fight. That's not our orientation, right? But in a Western culture where it's important to kind of raise recognition for oneself or one's brand or anything like that, uh, a lot of the way the system works is I pitch myself. I'm pitching myself. I'm pitching myself. Look at me. Look at me. Look what I've done. I've done all these things. Here's my resume. Let me tell you about my resume. You're always pitching yourself. And if you're from an Asian background where you're a little more sort of reticent about that kind of thing, you may be perceived as being unaccomplished. Uh, and so you get overlooked because you're not as loud, for instance. You know, you're not as memorable to the boss because you're not constantly sucking up to him or just even you're just not as loud about how you talk about your work. You don't think that's the way, you just don't do it that way. Um, and so that can be a disadvantage because then you're not entrusted uh, with uh, higher responsibilities. You could get passed over when it comes to promotions um, because you're not, uh, you're not recognized by the people who are in authority. Okay, so I think in a, in a more student context, this comes out this comes out sort of in, in organizations where the leadership is mainstream, or the more white it is, the more, the more you will feel this, this would, be my, uh, would be my guess. And it doesn't always look very hostile. Like, you may not actually feel like, well, I, I don't feel very oppressed, Greg. You know, I don't feel like I've been passed over. But, like, you should, I think it's worth listening to sort of how you interact with your peers and how they think about you. Uh, again, I'm not trying to sort of paint other people as necessarily evil or, or a negative kind of situation. But it's worth noting that a lot of times in like majority white settings, if you're an Asian leader or Asian participant, the compliment you'll get is like, oh, here, he's a really nice guy. Oh, she's so sweet, she's always gonna help you. And like, that's a, they may like you, but that's different than you being able to advance and achieve whatever goals you feel that you have. You know, so that's not necessarily racist per se, but I think that's a racialized, it's a microaggressive comment that I think actually does not speak to sort of your ability to move forward, right? A lot of people may like you, right? Oh yeah, so helpful, such a nice guy, right? But that's not the same thing as like, this person can be a leader, you know? And so again, when it comes to the politics of how things are done, you need to be sort of more self-aware, I believe, with the lens of race and ethnicity and culture. Otherwise, you, you may not be able to understand kind of what the dynamics are, what's going on. Even if you like know the rules of the game, uh, there are ways that culture plays itself out very, very subtly. And so again, listen with you know, some, some new ears and, and, open, and look at it with some, uh, some more open, different eyes. Now, in the face of this kind of thing, we tend to be pretty good at adapting. Like that's something that like Asians and Asian Americans are pretty universally fairly good at because uh, particularly if you're Vietnamese, like a lot of you came over with not a whole lot because you were fleeing from uh, like a collapsing regime. Like there's not a lot that you brought with you. So like your parents taught you to live in a constant state of crisis. Like you, you are practiced, you know how to adapt no matter what comes your way, which I think is a huge skill and a huge gift by the way, okay? But sometimes, in our effort to adapt, what we end up doing is we end up acquiring or assimilating into whatever culture uh, demands of us. And this is not the same thing as adapting. That's becoming somebody new. Um, you know, actually, there are many leadership development initiatives, even ones that are directed toward or they're for Asian Americans. A lot of leadership development that's for Asian Americans actually ends up encouraging essentially assimilation. Just be whiter. Just think whiter. Just do more white things. And that's different than adapting, because actually it's teaching you to become somebody who you're not actually. And I don't think that that's actually where you necessarily want to be. I don't think that's what I want for you, if you were to ask my opinion. That is not the best kind of outcome for me. It is pragmatic, I will give you that. You will have to adapt, that's for sure. But who you become at the end of the day is, much, is a very different question. It's about sort of how you see yourself and what you expect of yourself, what you want to be. So my intention is not to get you to change your behavior. Um, it's to reframe it, because I fully believe that the gifts that Asian Americans have are unique are valuable, are worthwhile to, to preserve and to cultivate and to strengthen. Um, you may not be from the same religious background that I am, but I feel so strongly about this because I believe that God purposely made me and you the way that you are. He gave me these eyes and this skin and this hair and these parents and this story and the languages that I speak and these experiences. 
These are things that God purposefully gave me. And so anyone who tells me that I'm not supposed to have it, I have to be different, is probably wrong. That's where I come down on that. I don't want that kind of experience for myself or for you. Um, I think all the things that we have, these traits, they can be redeemed as long as we try to refrain and kind of see what happens. So let's move forward. I'm going to try to be a little quicker here. I don't have much time. Um, respect for authority. Well, how can that be reframed positively? Well, for instance, I think that, um, okay, before we, sorry. The main thing is these four traits are not all there are. There are many, many more. But the skill that you need to acquire is that you need to be able to self-interpret. You need to be able to interpret yourself along your own values in a language that other people can understand. So like the whole taking the shoes off thing or like deciding things about dinner, right? There are values, reasons why we do those things. I simply must find the language to explain that uh, in a way that someone else of a different culture can speak similarly. You know, so in this case, this is actually very natural because we're talking about sort of leadership. And so I can talk about these traits in a way that sort of benefit my leadership and the benefits and can benefit other people as well when I lead them. So when it comes to respecting authority, um, you know, we genuinely are loyal when it comes to respecting authority. You know that you don't step on anybody's toes. We are respectful of sort of the way things are done. And also, we learn, we're much better at sort of learning from others because we're not constantly thinking we're this hotshot who knows everything and sort of like in the group interview, that tool bag who just keeps talking about himself, you know. You can, one way you can try to put a sock on that is just kind of tangentially mention, well, you know, I really value learning from other people because I'm new and let's just face it, we're all dumb college kids. That'll shut up the prick really quickly. All right, um, it, it's important because this is a value. Genuine loyalty is something that we value. Uh, when it comes to collectivist or consensus building behavior, uh, things that you can do here, um, you know, we don't necessarily believe that creativity is one person's job. We believe creativity comes from collaboration. The right decision is arrived at by multiple opinions and multiple factors being taken into account. So actually that benefits a lot of people if I think in a collectivist fashion. It's not just me succeeding, it is we succeeding because I think about the we. You know, so that is beneficial. Also, you're easier to work with because you're not thinking about kind of like wrangling a deal out of everybody every time you interact with someone. You're more inclusive. You know, if you're someone who's been in, in a board or a leadership group for a little while longer, someone new comes in, someone more marginal comes in, you are probably more instinctually aware of like that they might have something to say. And they could be brilliant. And so you want to make sure that they have the voice to say that instead of just letting the guy who's been there forever keep talking and talking and talking and pitching his own ideas. So inclusive leadership is very valuable, especially in, in the age that we're in. I think we're moving more towards kind of team-based orientation of success. Um, control and emotionally restrained. Uh, like, frankly, we just don't think it's everybody's business how I'm feeling all the time. So, like, I just don't show everybody how I feel all the time. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think also we, are, we have the capacity to be much more stable under crisis because we feel like it's not worth the time to, you know, always vent or feel things, right? If things go south, you've got to just buckle back up and do it. Instead of just kind of crying about it and moping about it for like a whole week and, you know, eating three pints of ice cream per day. You know, you, you just don't do that. We don't do that. We think that we, we've been taught that, like, life is a crisis, so prepare. You know, that's a valuable thing. We're much more stable uh, when things change, uh, when organizations change, when leadership changes, when systems change. We adapt. We can handle that. And so, like, not being so emotionally attached to things can be a benefit. And I think that's something that if we can interpret that for other people, they can see that as a valuable thing. Um, I don't even know where I am in my notes. Today. Sorry. Um, Okay, when it comes to being modest, for instance, um, if I'm not constantly focusing on me, my, my, my awesomeness, um, that means that I can actually help the people around me. I'm thinking about them, not just about me. Um, you know, so it, it can mean that when you are in a team, you give them the credit that they deserve, which is good, because if you're in the same department for a long time, they won't resent you over time. This is a good thing. Uh, as you keep interacting with them and you keep leading them, you're also more inclusive of their ideas. You know, everyone in America says they're a team player. That's not true. What they're really saying is, I'm really talented, you should bring me on your team. But like, Kobe Bryant's not playing so well right now because he's not a very good point guard. A good point guard increases the scoring potential of everybody else in the lineup. That's what a team player actually does. And if you're modest, if you're not so worried, if you're not a ball hog when it comes to attention or responsibility, you can actually like legitimately see that, oh, there's a person who's better at this than I am. We can acknowledge that, you know? We're not sort of so obsessed with sort of proving that we're better than everyone else. So promote me, promote me, promote me. Like we can actually just see the facts of like, oh, I'm not as first in this particular experience or this particular thing. Let me, let me put that over to somebody else. And that can be received as a gift. I'm building relationship. We care about relationships. This is a good thing. So I know I butts through that. I'm just trying to be conscious of the time. But you see how when we reframe these things, they're actually seen in a very different light. Mostly what I need to do is learn how to talk about myself, talk about my values in a way that is effective, that actually meets the needs, that is an answer to the question that other folks, particularly white leadership structures, 
are interested in. They have certain answers, but they have other goals that we can meet because we're different. Okay, so um, that's the main thing to see, that you yourself, you have an authentic experience, an, an ethnic identity that is valuable, that is precious, I would say even sacred. And then actually there's a strength in that if you're willing to cultivate it and, and, and kind of dig into it a little more. So with that, I want to leave uh, some space for questions and answers. Uh, I'll try and answer any questions you might have. I know that was really blessing through the last part. Sorry about that. But if you have any questions, have your take. Yeah, I think sort of the cultural moment we're in is like you will have to endure a certain level of cultural dissonance for a little while longer. Uh, I think if, if we do our job well when it comes to sort of being authentic with ethnic identity and leadership, the, your, your, our kids, our younger siblings, will not have as hard a time. It will not actually be so weird to have non-Western-oriented non -like views of leadership and, and uh, values. I think actually if we are willing to kind of stick to it, um, we can actually see that kind of change. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Uh, you uh, mentioned uh, near the beginning of the workshop how one of the reasons there are a lot of Asian or Asian American leaders in corporates, things like that, one of the reasons was um, something referred to as the bamboo ceiling. Mm -hmm. What exactly is that, or like what is that metaphor? Right, so it's similar to sort of the glass ceiling, glass ceiling when it comes to uh, women in employment and advancement. It, and it, the, the, data would pr the data shows that if you put two equally qualified candidates as far as their performance, their achievement, the physical metrics, basic metrics against one another, um, if you're a woman versus a man, we know that the, the, the uh, wage scale, there's a skewing of 22%. If you're white, it gets worse if you're not white compared to other white women or white men. You know, so, and the same thing is true, I would say of Asian Americans, we get paid less proportionally and you know, at the time of promotion, if there's a choice, the system for whatever reason, whether personally or just systemically, it skews to pick white people over Asian people uh, just because is the reason it's usually given. It just, oh, you know, that's the way it worked out. You know? So uh, I don't necessarily see it as sort of a necessarily like an individual, like someone's very hateful about it, but when I descri I'm describing a phenomenon when it comes to sort of corporate opportunities that are not distributed proportionally uh, equitably is another thing, you can talk about sort of equality, but proportionally not being uh, distributed according to sort of performance and achievement and education and sort of work put in. You know, so you'd have to work some percentage higher, more, as an Asian to get an equal promotion or equal pay as someone who's a white male, for instance. So uh, for Asian American women, you know, you have those two ceilings against you and, you know, I think that's something that's it's actually very important for you to think about as you look for where you want to work. You know, are they friendly to this kind of thing or are they, do they perpetuate this kind of system? Uh, because you know you might be hindering yourself, or might, you, there might be better options out there, and you need to be aware of those kinds of things. So. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Back there, yeah. So, if, like, um, do you think like I would have a problem if I went to an Asian country to get a job? With, is there like similar things like in different countries? Like, like, sure. What's your ethnic background? I'm just curious. I'm white. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so in my understanding, both from a sociological and, and I would say a spiritual understanding of things, whoever is the majority traditionally has power, right? So like if you're in a country where everybody speaks one language, you don't speak it, you don't have power, right? Even if you are smarter than everyone else, you're richer than everyone else, you don't have power, right? You have to actually co-op their power with your resources. The thing is, though, because of decades, centuries of Western uh, European imperialism and sort of the extension of that as political science major, sorry, but American uh, hegemony kind of that's resulted as, uh, consequently, even after the, the Cold War, um, being white is usually better. You know, because the extension of West, uh, um, of European and American values and culture and physical power, military power projection, uh, leave a pretty deep imprint. You know, so like, why do Filipinos eat Spam? It's because GIs lived there after World War II. There's no reason they should eat that food, right? Uh, another thing, why do Vietnamese not have their own actual written language? Why do they have westernized, Romanized characters with accents? Because the French took it away. So like, you know, what do you say about that? Like, that, that's the history of things. Now, I don't kind of go around with sort of a huge chip on my shoulder all the time about that, but I think um, you have to look at kind of the larger picture of the historical perspective of sort of how have nations and cultures arrived at their particular point? No one is merely the consequence of your own, your own choices. That's also American individualism. That's a, a kind of fiction we've been bought into, you know, that we think, yeah, I can be my own man. That's not really true. And if you're Asian, Asian American, you, you know that's really not true. You know you really can't. You're not just your own thing. You're, you're the product, the goods and the bads of who's ever come before you. You know, so um, I don't know. If you went overseas to get, try and get a job, they might like you more because you're white. Because, you know, that may not be a positive thing. It'd just be sort of curious about sort of like, oh, he's a Westerner. That's interesting. You know, I'm not saying that's a good thing, you know, but it usually <laughs> skews, it skews upward in, in, in the sense of opportunities most of the time 
if it, all things being equal, I would say. Yeah, I mean, anybody can be an asset, depending, like, all ethnic identities are assets, as long as we understand them appropriately in the context of, you know, larger culture and norms. Any other questions? Maybe the last one. Yeah, go ahead. Talk about reframing the behavior. Mm -hmm. Is there that's good when and it seems like it's going to take a while? Um, is there an intermediate? Uh, there's an immediate uh, thing that you, you suggest to do, say for someone that is close to a high executive level position that they want to go to CEO, uh, where you know they've been committed and all these stuff, but now they just know about your, your, your what you suggested. Right, right. Too late. Is there anything that you can tell them? About, okay. Um, do your best to educate yourself, so lead in, in contexts where you're not comfortable. Uh, I encourage you to think about leading in mainstream organizations, but you don't have to adopt their values, but you need to know what the water tastes like when you get there. Um, and I would also say lead in organizations where you do feel comfortable, like you're all in VSA or something like it, I'm glad you are, I think it's good for you. you know? So having both, I think will encourage you to understand your baseline, your cultural baseline better. Uh, you know, read books. I got two books up here. One of them is University Press. It is Christian oriented, but a lot of my understanding of these things comes from that. You know, Invitation to Lead, and then Jane Kion's Breaking the Bamboo Ceiling, pretty famous book as well. Um, also, if you if there are other Asian American kind of leaders in your in your sector or nearby, you know, read something. Uh, get 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 lunch and beg for some advice. You know, like some people can they can help you kind of do that. You know, it is a it is a long journey, but I would say kind of reach out, take whatever next steps you have in front of you, um, whatever's available. So uh, with that, I am going to close this briefly. I just want to say, so first, um, you all being here really makes me excited. I think it's awesome that you're part of these Asian American organizations like VSA and their equivalents. Uh, from, for me, from a spiritual standpoint, I believe God smiles on these organizations because they are creating a safe haven, a safe space where you can grow and be accepted without the feeling and the fear of assimilation that you have to kind of conform to someone else's fashion or cultural or value sense. And I think that that's a really valuable thing. Um, for, for you. So I'm glad you're in these organizations and you know, I've seen how, how, how much they can help. Um, again, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be growing or adapting or changing to adopt whiter, more Western ways, but again, it's why are you going there, how did you get there? I mean, I mean maybe you've even, I can think of people that I know, you know, they go off to Wall Street, you know, and they, they're this hotshot making their money, and they come home for Christmas, you know, or maybe in your case, that or something like that, right? And they're having dinner with the family, right? And the way they're talking about themselves and sort of their achievements and their salary and all that stuff, they're really excited about all the things they're doing. And your parents are kind of looking at them because it's like, ah, you're a little different now, right? Now, they're actually proud of the kid for making a lot of money and kind of achieving that dream. But who have they become along the way? Who have they lost to become that? I think is something that is really worth noting. Again, you can choose that if you want to go there. But from my perspective, ethnically and spiritually, you're actually sort of killing yourself your, your background, your identity, to replace it with something that's just merely pragmatic, it's not actually you. you know? So a more nuanced approach to that is sort of what I'm hoping you're kinda get at, you'll kind of get at there. And also, hey, honestly, your kids will be really screwed up later if you don't kind of reckon with your own ethnic identity right now. So <laughs> think of it that way, posterity. Um, and so yeah, finally, again, God made you guys Vietnamese and whatever ethnicity you are for a reason. And no one gets to tell you otherwise. We do grow, we do adapt, we do cross culture, but who you are, I believe, is who you're meant to be. And it's really an issue of digging into that and having a deeper understanding of why you are that way. You know, there are gifts that we have that are really, really great as a culture, as cultures. And you know, for me in university, one of our tenets of mission is that uh, we want to see world changes developed. And I believe that you folks in organizations like this, coming to something like this, investing in yourselves like this, you're actually investing in your own future to, to benefit um, future Asian Americans, non-Asian Americans in a lot of different ways. So again, I'm really thankful that you're here. So thanks for the time, hope I've been helpful, and feel free to find me after.